Parents, the following program is intended for people over the age of 13. If your kids are younger than that, please use the YouTube Kids app. Welcome to Scary Stories, the channel that tells you scary stories. Peter Bernard's Peter Bernard. Scary Stories for Adults. Welcome to the Scary Stories Best of February Continued to our special. I'm your old pal Bigfoot. On this extra long episode, Henry Lee Dogman and I will attempt to entertain you with a whole slew of allegedly real scary dogman stories sent in by viewers such as you and adapted by us. Before we get to our first story, which is brand new and never heard before, please allow me to point out that this episode is executive produced by Julie Sadler. Julie made a generous donation to us via paypal.me slash peterbernard209 and without her this extra long episode you're watching now would never have been possible thanks julie this episode's dedicated to you another way to become a scary stories executive producer is by joining our affordable paid subscribers club over at peterbernard.com this first story is also our last story what I mean to say is, it's an all-new two-part tale. We're going to tell you the first part now, which is complete in and of itself. Later, at the very end of the show, we will then tell you the all-new sequel, which I think is just as scary. But first things first, and this first story is called... The Dorseyville Dog Man. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I have a dog man story to tell you that my mother told to me when I was very young. Then, I have a second story for you about my own dog man sighting, which happened on the exact same property many years afterward. This happened back before I was born when my parents first moved into the house that I later grew up in. It was in a place called Dorseyville, and back then, the house was practically in the forest. It was far more suburban when I was growing up, but the way my mother described the house when they first moved in was like she was moving into the vast wilderness and leaving civilization behind. According to my mother... My father had been seeing something walking around near the property at night, and he had not told her about it. She didn't notice this right away. She first noticed that Dad was worried about something, and that his mood had grown sullen. She knew something strange was going on that he wasn't sharing with her. So, one night, she pretended to be asleep, then... When he eventually rose from the bed, she quietly followed to spy on him and try to figure out what the secret was that he was keeping from her. She found him on the back porch, staring off into the woods. Watching from a window, Mom got the binoculars and after zooming in on the forest that Dad was looking at, she said she was horrified to notice a devil dog walking around on its hind legs like a human, with shining red eyes and ears standing straight up on its evil-looking head. Dad watched until the beast eventually seemed to leave, and Mom watched Dad watching the monster. When he came back inside, Mom confronted her husband and asked him directly why he wasn't telling her that there was some kind of werewolf thing on their property at night. You can see it too? Dad asked, amazed. It turned out he thought it was the ghost of his great uncle who had been some kind of a brujo or sorcerer or 
magician or a skinwalker or whatever. I don't know about that stuff, and I don't want to know. This guy, this great uncle, he was feared by my father's entire family. Even though this guy had passed on years earlier, Dad thought that the dog man was the ghost or a spirit of this dead relative and feared that seeing him was a bad omen. Mom disagreed and felt it was a real animal, a real upright walking canid, and she used its alleged existence to keep me in line when I would misbehave. I really believed in the monster when I was young, even though I had never seen it, and even though the house by then was not really all that close to the forest at all. When I grew into my teenaged and cynical years, I felt that since Mom used the stories as cautionary tales to get me to behave, that automatically must have meant that they could not possibly be true. I guess I carried that belief into adulthood, if I even thought about those old Dogman stories anymore at all. That would change decades later, when I had a personal experience that would alter my worldview permanently and completely. And we'll tell you all about that story at the very end of this extra long episode. It's another all new, never before heard story. So please stay tuned for that. We'll be right back with Henry Lee Dogman and a whole bunch of scary Dogman stories right after this important message from PQ River. You know what time is coming soon, don't you? The day of the wearing of the green skin. I'm inviting you to me St. Patrick's Day Dogman Party. The one and only Dr. Death St. Patrick's Day Scary Story Special. An extra long episode, and only us ghouls and ghosts and deceased individuals are invited. Oh, all right. You seem cool. You can come too. It all happens here on the Scary Stories NYC channel, Tuesday, March 17th. Feel free to arrive early. All my other guests are late. Welcome to Scary Stories NYC. I'm Henry Lee Dogman, filling in for Bigfoot, who is having his footprints plastered. Before we get started, I'd like to announce that our executive producer for this episode is Victoria Hairworks. Thank you, Victoria. We couldn't do it without you. If you'd like to become a Scary Stories executive producer, then just sign up for our paid subscribers club at peterbernard.com. How many of you have ever wondered where Dogman goes when he's not being sighted and encountered by humans? Why is he so apparently elusive? Is it because he's just wily and good at hiding himself? Or is it because he has an ability to exit stage left from our entire reality? These are questions asked by the man who sent us this next alleged encounter. The things he claimed happened to him might seem strange, but they're not so strange that others haven't already reported similar cases to researchers like Stan Gordon. This one is not alleged to have taken place in Pennsylvania, as most of Mr. Gordon's cases do. This story took place in another location well known for their dogman legends. Michigan. And the name of this story is The Michigan Dogman is not from Michigan. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I have seen a dogman two different times. I think it might have been the same one in spite of the fact that my first sighting took place when I was 20 years old and my second when I was 52. Normally, I wouldn't think an animal could still look the same and be in the same condition over three decades later. But once you hear my story, you may understand why I think time doesn't work the same way for these creatures as it does for us normal folk. So I grew up in a hunting family and I've hunted since I was a boy. When I was 20, I was out hunting one day when I noticed a large wolf from my tree stand. I watched it through my sight. 
I didn't want to fire on it, but I wanted to figure out what it was doing there and if it was going to leave soon. You can't really have two predators in one location, so if he wasn't just passing through, then I'd either have to leave or attempt to convince him to. I saw it go behind a bush and he was partially hidden from my view. I zoomed in and squinted, but I couldn't really tell what it was doing over there. Was it sleeping? Was it using the bush as a hunting blind? Was it devouring its prey from earlier? The wolf was really wasting my time, that's all I knew for sure. I got so preoccupied with the big wolf that I didn't even notice two deer approaching. It was two bucks, one young and the other mature. The wolf noticed them though, and he slunk out of his bush silently. I saw the deer first when I noticed what the wolf was looking at. Then, the wolf did this thing that almost made me gasp out loud. He stood up on his hind legs. It was more than a little surprising to see him do that, as I had never heard of wolves having this ability or displaying this behavior. Both of the deer were facing away toward the left, and that wolf started slowly creeping up behind them, looking like a bad guy in an old movie or something. My mind tried to make sense of what I was seeing. If the animal survived by creeping up on its prey, then walking on two legs might serve an evolutionary advantage, because two feet would probably be quieter than four. Standing up also gave the large wolf a height advantage over the deer that he would not have had down on all fours. Like I said, my mind was trying to make sense of it. I was trying to explain away and compartmentalize this wondrous thing I was witnessing. I was trying to label it and get over it without truly appreciating what was happening. And then, the upright walking wolf stopped being 20 feet behind the deer and he was immediately behind them, standing inches behind and about to strike the younger deer with no warning. I need to slow down here and re-explain what I just said in order to be certain that I'm being understood. The wolf didn't run forward toward the deer. It didn't jump toward the deer. It didn't walk. It was at first 20 feet away. Then it was immediately behind. The hindquarters of the younger deer came up to the bottom of the chest of the upright walking wolf, who looked as though he were preparing to pounce from behind onto the throat of the deer. There had been literally no time between the monster being one place and it being 20 feet in front of that one place. What I had seen did not look real, and that was because it couldn't have been real. It was like a splice in a film. It was like an edit. Or maybe it was like using a cheat code in a game. It was also just a little too much for me to deal with at that moment in space and time. And I shouted out in shock. I'd never done that before when hunting, but I'd never seen something impossible happen in front of my eyes before either. So there's a first time for everything. My shout spooked the deer who ran off to my left. It caught the interest of the upright walking wolf, who turned and looked directly at me. Its eyes were blinding, like two little suns in its head shining back at me painfully. I heard it growl like a real-life animal. I saw it bare its teeth like a real-life animal, and I remembered it had the ability to move great distances with no time passing in between. I suddenly grew panicked that it would teleport or whatever right up to my tree stand, so I took aim through my sight. I aimed right at the face of the monster, who was not just an ordinary wolf. There was intelligence behind the savagery both in the expression and the body language of the wolf thing. Maybe because I'm a human, I might be prejudiced toward thinking that bipedal animals look more intelligent. Maybe it just seemed smarter than a wolf to me, or maybe it really was. I neglected to ask it to submit to an IQ test, so all I can give you is my opinion and my gut feeling. Even as my knees and hands shook, and even as my heart beat hard and fast in my chest, 
I was seeing an intelligent consciousness looking back at me from behind those glowing and inhuman eyes. I was seeing them up close through my viewfinder, and I was trying to build up the nerve to pull that trigger. In the next instant, the wolf was gone. It hadn't run off, it just disappeared. I grew panicked that it might reappear anywhere around me at any moment, so I slid and jumped out of my tree stand, and I ran all the way back to my truck, then broke the speed limit getting home. Over the years, I've told my story to people I meet. Usually, it's after they've told me their stories about Bigfoot or about ghosts. I always listen attentively to their stories, which I find fascinating. Then, I tell them mine. And if they're willing to accept the idea of a wolf standing up and walking around, they rarely seem to take the next step to accepting that these upright walking wolves have the ability to blink in and out of existence and play with space-time in ways that we don't yet understand. When I get to the part about how I saw the creature through the sight, and I saw it suddenly not be there, they tell me that the animal sped away quickly and I was just unable to see it do so because I was staring through the viewfinder. That makes no sense. I was in a tree stand. I had a pretty good view of the area from up there. I also possess peripheral vision, as do many humans, and nothing moved through my peripheral vision on either side when that dogman or wolfman or whatever he was disappeared. Running away in any direction or even climbing a tree would all have been impossible. It was late autumn. The leaves were gone from the trees, and visibility was excellent. I would have spotted anything that large in a second, no matter what direction it was going in, or how fast it was going there. The only two explanations I can come up with are that maybe it had the ability to teleport, to instantly move from one location to another, or, and this is the theory that I feel more strongly about, maybe it has the ability to walk in and out of what we call reality. Like, maybe we're all non-player characters, and that upright walking wolf is the kid who actually paid for the game that we're all in. Or, maybe he's the kid's neighbor, but you get my point. I could be wrong, because both events I witnessed could be explained by teleportation just as easily. I just didn't see where he teleported the second time. So, years passed. I got married. I got divorced. I got married a second time to a lady we can call Mona, who is half native. We live in the woods, which is the only place she wants to live, and it's fine with me too, at least most of the time. After you get close to a person and live with them for years, you tell all your stories to them. They have them living inside them as well. I told my wife all about the upright walking wolf creature I had seen that day, and I told her how it looked, like a gray wolf with beautiful, delicate markings all around on its fur, with a mostly pure white chest and underbelly. Its eyes glowed a bright bluish white, and its expressions were intelligent, not typical dog expressions. I wasn't even sure she was listening when I told her about that, as she never told me her opinion in return. For all I knew, she'd been thinking about something else as I spoke, and never even knew that I had once seen what I think might have been a dogman. Then, one night, we were camping in the woods behind our backyard, and I noticed Mona was staring up the hill through the trees. I didn't like the look on her face, but I knew better than to ask her a question or disturb the silence in any way. When she had something to tell me, she would. I began to think about the dogman or wolfman, and I grabbed my weapon out of my bag. Mona took it from me and aimed it up the hill a ways. I looked in the direction she was pointing and I saw it. Or I saw him. He was mostly facing away and he was looking at something I couldn't see, but it looked exactly like my dog man from 30 years earlier. It was a large gray 
wolf, and it was standing on its hind legs. Its markings were so similar, I was certain that if it were not the exact same animal, it must be a descendant of the original. I could see there was brown mixed in with the gray, black, and white markings on its back fur. A truly magnificent creature, a remarkable sight to behold. Seeing him there was one of the honestly breathtaking moments of my life. Mona took the safety off, and the sound that made alerted the dogman to her presence. He turned around, and before she could decide whether to fire or not, that dogman was no longer in existence. This time, we both saw it. She was looking through the scope, and I was staring at it with the naked eye, about 100 feet from its location. It was there, and then it was not. I panicked, wondering if it would reappear in our camp. I said as much to Mona, who calmly informed me that the creature was gone. She handed me back the weapon and went back to whatever she had been doing beforehand. I looked around, not so sure of things as she was. I suggested we go on home, that we'd been threatened, and so we should leave. She told me again that the creature had gone and wouldn't be coming back that night. I asked her how she could be so sure, and she turned and gave me this expression like the question I had just asked was the stupidest question anyone had ever asked her. She finally agreed to pack up and walk home with me because she could tell I was not going to be able to relax until I was out of those woods. But even so, as terrifying as that was, I'm glad that second encounter happened. Now I have someone else who has seen the same thing that I've seen, so I feel a little less crazy about it. And... We both feel that the Michigan Dogman is really not from here at all. It's most likely an interdimensional being that only visits our reality. In other words, the Michigan Dogman is not from Michigan. Don't go anywhere. We've got a Wisconsin Dogman story coming up right after this important word from PQ River. I'd like to take a moment to say that if you have a scary story you'd like to tell us here, you can write Peter at peterbernard.com or you can call our new Scary Stories hotline number and leave it to us in the form of a voicemail message. It's easy to remember. 804-LE-SCARY. That's 804-L-E-S-C-A-R-Y or... 804-537-2279 Can Dogman Eye Shine Hypnotize? Dear Scary Stories NYC I've been watching your Dogman episodes for a while and it reminds me of this thing that happened when I was in camp back when I was young. I kind of always wrote this incident off because I didn't have an explanation for it so it kind of bothered me to think about it. I think I decided I must have been played a joke on by the other kids, but none of them later admitted to that, so I don't know. Usually when I was younger, if someone got me really good with a joke, it was only a matter of time before they would want to take their victory lap and claim their credit for a great prank. But nobody ever seemed to know what I was talking about when I would start to bring this one up, so I sort of filed it away and did my best to forget about it. After watching a couple dozen of your shows, I'm starting to wonder if something actually happened to me back then, or I guess I should say, almost happened to me. I was in summer camp at the time. I don't want to name which one, but we were in the woods in Wisconsin. I really liked camp, but there were some kids there who were not particularly very nice. Let's call the one who bothered me the most Melvin, because that's what he used to call me to be insulting. He thought I was a nerd, so he called me Melvin. It was funny to him. So, Melvin had this thing he would do where he would keep a large supply of spitballs with him at all times. And when he found himself approaching a vulnerable angle on a good potential victim, he'd be ready in a few seconds 
to fire one of the most painful spitballs of all time toward whatever was the most sensitive part of you he could reach from his angle. Once he got you, he would laugh so hard that he'd end up often rolling on the ground. But what was worse than that was all the other kids would invariably join in like this was the funniest thing that had ever happened. So anyway, one night, I was up for some reason and out a little past curfew, heading back to my building to crash out for the night. It was really misty and foggy out there that night, and I was a little freaked out by that to be honest. The harder it was to see, the easier it was for Melvin to hide. Then, I saw the strangest thing. It looked like two eyes lit up golden yellow in the foggy darkness. I couldn't be certain of what I was seeing, so I looked harder. And the harder I looked, the more I felt drawn in by the lights. And I felt them sort of asking me to come closer. Feeling more curious than I ever had before, I had to know what I was looking at. I walked closer, and I could sense the lights moving closer to me as well. After a while, I could begin to make out the silhouette of a form. The eyes seemed to belong to a very tall person who was coming closer and closer just as I was walking closer to him. I felt under his command essentially and he was using my curiosity to make me do his bidding as the very tall figure emerged from the fog so that I could see him clearly for the first time, I saw to my horror that this man had a dog head. Those glowing eyes were in the head of some kind of demon form. I wanted to scream, and I wanted to run, but I found myself just staring into those eyes instead. My eyes were tearing, I had never felt so frightened in my life, but I was frozen in a trance that its eyes created. I felt my life flashing past me, and I regretted almost everything I had ever done. I was in no way ready to let go, but I felt that my time was now ending. I don't know if that dogman put that idea in my head, or if I was just facing facts. Suddenly... A sharp pain hit the back of my right ear and I winced. Turning around, I saw Melvin laughing hysterically and rolling on the ground. He had hit me with one of his spitballs. I looked back to where the dogman had been and nothing was there. You could probably understand now why I tried to file this experience away. But after all these years, I have to admit... I'm beginning to wonder, can Dogman Eyeshine hypnotize? Welcome to Scary Stories NYC. I'm Henry Lee Dogman, filling in for Bigfoot, who is having new headshots taken. Before we get started, please allow me to mention that today's episode is executive produced by Erman Case. Thank you, Erman. We couldn't do it without you. Let's start the show off with a tale about a guy who discovered the hard way that you better not bring your new girlfriend onto Dogman's turf. It's a story that he calls Dogman Ruined My Date. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I have a special problem with the Dogman. I had one encounter with one of them and I wrecked my night and messed up my name around the scene where I used to hang. I literally got a new job in another town just to start over because of the mess that Dogman made of my life. I guess I should be grateful that's all he did. It could have been much worse. You won't believe this, but it all started at a church picnic. It was supposed to be a family affair, but a bunch of us were young, unattached adults and we soon separated from the moms and dads and children to have our own sort of counter picnic deeper into the woods and away from prying eyes. 
Suffice to say that we were all having a lot of fun and enjoying each other's company, sharing funny stories and so forth. After a while, we kind of naturally started to pair off and I ended up with this really cute redhead. She started teaching me things about kissing that I had never heard of. She was kind of a librarian of kissing concepts and a genius performer of them too. She told me that she knew Taekwondo and I felt I had met the perfect girl. She had my young self enthralled and somehow I was managing to keep her entertained and interested in me as well. And then, the dog man happened to walk through our part of the woods. In fairness to me, this was something taller than a bear, and it was on us suddenly. I didn't hear the thing approaching. All I knew is one of the girls screamed to my left, and then there was this towering nightmare dog head thing, snarling and swiping at whoever got too close to him. Now here is where I started embarrassing myself. I screamed, a really high-pitched scream. I tried to stop, but I couldn't. I was totally freaked out. That thing was going to end all our lives, and it wasn't even something that could be real. That made me feel insane, and I think the out-of-control screaming was an outgrowth of that. In either case, the screech I was emitting hurt the ears of that dogman. He glared at me. Then... He sort of almost a mime walked toward me, as though my screaming like a three-year-old were as strong as the strongest ocean waves, holding him back from getting at me. Then I did what became the most famous thing I ever did for a while. I grabbed that girl I had been talking to, and I hid behind her. The dogman stopped walking toward me and began barking and growling in my direction, which made that girl cry. It made me cry too, but nobody could see because I was hiding behind her skirts. So, a group of loud teenagers ran by just by chance, and the dogman got spooked by their noise and bolted. We were saved. I wanted to go back to flirting with the girl, but she was having none of it. Why did you hide behind me when that monster was walking toward us, she demanded to know. Well... You said you knew Taekwondo, I responded lamely. Everyone groaned, and they all took turns mocking me and calling me a coward, and far worse things than that. As we walked back, others gathered around the girl protectively, and I tagged along behind the entire group, essentially rejected for my cowardice. And so that's the reason I moved and started my life over. Because... Dogman. Ruin my date. The ape-like dogman. Dear Scary Stories NYC. This is a story from the days when I used to camp alone, which is something I wouldn't do any longer. It's just too dangerous, and I don't mean because of the dogman. Or at least, not just because of the dogman. I was camping in Pennsylvania in the 1990s, Probably 1993, I'm guessing. I had broken up with a woman I really cared about, or actually she had dumped me. I was still in my 20s, so I thought it was a big deal to get dumped. I felt like the world was over, and it's true that my old world certainly was. We had one of those relationships where I lived for her. I saved money to get her stuff. I thought of her first in all decisions. And then, I found out she was sleeping with the guy who used to beat me up in high school and who is now on welfare. I found this out when she told me she needed me to move out so that he could move in. It was a lot for my mind to take in at that age and so my response was to go camping deep in the woods every single moment that I possibly could just to get everyone else's voices out of my head. And back then, when you went camping in the deeper parts of the woods, you could really find yourself isolated for quite some time. I didn't own a cell phone, and I don't know that one would have worked in most of the places I camped anyway. So as I said, I was camping in a small clearing in a woods in Pennsylvania, but don't ask me where at this late date. It was probably closer to Pittsburgh than any other major city. 
are there woods outside of Pittsburgh? Then that's where I was. So, I was hearing strange noises around the camp, but I couldn't be certain I wasn't hearing the fire crackling or imagining the sounds. I kept thinking I was hearing a huffing sound, like a sound a gorilla would make when it was getting agitated. I figured I was imagining it since I had always wanted to see a Bigfoot, in those days at least. I never thought of them as dangerous. I mean, that was the 90s. I expected them to be shy and friendly, like on TV. So I thought I was hearing things because my imagination really wanted to see Bigfoot so badly that it made up the sounds itself, or something like that. I went to sleep in my tent, and then I woke a while later needing to relieve myself. Before I got out of my tent, though, I distinctly heard that huffing sound. In that context, in the dark, it really put the fear into me, and I wasn't sure if I wanted to exit that tent any longer. No sounds followed for what seemed like forever, and I found it harder and harder to hold it all in. So eventually, I unzipped the tent and danced a two-step over to the closest bush to do my duty. Sure enough, just as I was finishing up, I heard the sound, but much closer than ever before. I jumped in the air and doused myself in the process. It sounded like an ape or gorilla, and it sounded like an extremely large one. My eyes were pretty well adjusted to the darkness, so I looked around, squinting and trying to see what was hiding out there just past some of these trees. Craning my neck around some leaves, I caught sight for just one split second of bright eye shine in the forest. And then those eyes shut and I watched as a large dog's head tilted back in a loud, long, soulful howl. I backed away toward my tent, not turning my back on the howling dog in the forest. I watched as it stood up, higher, higher, ridiculously higher. How could a dog be that tall? I felt like I must be having a nightmare when the creature moved out of the tree cover and I saw that it was actually standing up on its hind legs like a human and walking bipedally. Standing like that, it was far larger than I was. I don't even want to guess how tall. Tall enough that I turned and ran. I dove back into my tent as though that would somehow be protection against whatever that giant monster thing actually was. Inside the zipped up tent, I curled into a fetal position and the dog began barking loudly on me from above me. It was like being pummeled physically. It was literally painful. I cried myself to sleep and woke up feeling pretty crazy. That night with the ape-like dog man changed me. It rattled me. It altered me. It shattered me. It made me realize my own frailties and it rubbed my face in the realization that the universe was not created to please or entertain me. That helped me to take things less personally and to be a more persistent person. And I owe it all to the complete and total nervous breakdown brought on by the ape-like dogman. Dogman against the white sky. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I may possibly have had an experience with the famous Beast of Bray Road, also known as the Wisconsin Werewolf. I was legend tripping one night with my girlfriend, and we had visited Bray Road the night before. It was by this point some time after dawn, and we were driving back, once again driving on Bray Road itself. My girlfriend told me to stop, and we both got out of the car to stare off into the distance. You can see a long way over there as the ground is very level, and there aren't many trees or buildings. Well, 
Don't you know, she pointed out to me a figure silhouetted against the overcast white morning sky. It looked just like the legendary dogman to both of us, but we were so far away we couldn't really be certain. It felt like it had to be the beast of Bray Road because why would a human be walking around with a dog head in the middle of a farm right after dawn? Seems very unlikely to me. Seems much more likely that we saw Dogman against the white sky, the Dogman and the oversized spider. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I have a Dogman story for you, but if you don't mind, I'd like to include another strange sighting I made back on that same day. I don't know if they are related, but since I never saw a cryptid before that day, and I've never seen one since, they are certainly related to each other in my mind. This was the late 1960s. I had taken some rail line upstate to see my Aunt Esther, formerly of Manhattan. She had retired upstate when my Uncle Merrill passed on, and I missed her. She had come to pick me up at the station in her Volkswagen Beetle when I arrived. A few days later, when I was set to leave, Esther was too busy to drive me, so she suggested I walk the scenic route back to the train station. I was actually excited at the opportunity to get to walk through nature for a few minutes and collect my thoughts before heading back into the city. A good part of the walk was a tree-lined path, and as I approached one tree in particular, I saw something on it that I found difficult to define with my eyes. What was I looking at? It was about the size of my hands put together with my fingers splayed out as far as I could make them go. It was a dark brown color. I took a step off the path toward the oddity and it darted away from me jumping from the tree it was on to the branch of another tree to the bark of yet a third. It moved like a spider monkey yet it had eight legs and no apparent head. It was some kind of very large hairy spider but twice as large as a tarantula and with hair twice as long as well i could see breezes blowing its hair the giant spider stayed perfectly still on the tree it had jumped to and i stood out of breath for a while trying to take all of this in there's no way a spider that moved like a spider monkey was native to upstate new york was i seeing an escaped exotic pet? Eventually, I had to resume walking a risk missing my train, but when I did so, the monkey spider, as I came to think of it, made an agitated clicking sound that hurt my ears. I gave it as wide a berth as the pathway would allow me and hurried past the strange thing toward the station. As you can imagine, my mind was filled with amazement and surprise, wondering what had just happened to me. And then, like out of a strange nightmare bedtime story, I saw a werewolf trot across the path. I mean, it was a wolf mixed with a man walking upright like a man but bent over a bit. It had a wolf or dog-like head, and it was uniformly dark in color. It trotted out of the woods panting like a dog with its tongue hanging out, and it trotted bipedally back into the woods on my left. It did not appear to be wearing a collar, so I think it was a wild animal or possibly feral. I ran the rest of the way to the train station, deliberately not looking to my left or right or up or down. I had a frightened feeling in my belly that I had walked back or forward in time, and that when I got to the station, it would be a thousand years old and out of use, or else it wouldn't have been built yet. My chest was panicking. I was out of breath. I absolutely couldn't wait to see that familiar train station. I remember praying that the station please still be there. It was the craziest feeling that I've ever had, like I really had entered the Twilight Zone. 
when the train station was exactly where it was supposed to be, and I could see that I was still in the present day, I wanted to cry very badly. There were people around, though, so I tried to play it cool. Why are you crying, sir? I escaped the werewolf and returned to the 20th century in time for my train, that's why. Anyone would think I was out of my head if I told them why I was blushing and all flustered. So, I walked back into my tribe, and I went back to acting boring and fitting in, and I've never ever once since that day ever had another day like it. I visited Aunt Esther several more times, and we walked that scenic route together multiple times, but never again did I ever see anything out of the ordinary over there. It was like on that one day, some kind of doorway between this world and that opened up, and I happened to be there to see it. Or else, Aunt Esther put mushrooms in my tea that day because I have no other explanation for the dog man and the oversized spider. The New Hampshire Dog Man Dear Scary Stories NYC I have a story for you about the worst week of my life. I was camping in the White Mountain National Forest in New Hampshire with my camping buddy Ned. We were walking north along Shoal Pond Brook and just exploring. The plan was to go a week north then a week south, and back to civilization. We had only hiked about three days when the dog man decided we were going to have to change our plans drastically. Do you know the stories of people camping in the woods and having pebbles or acorns thrown at them? In the past, it was attributed to ghosts. More recently, people have connected Bigfoot or Sasquatch with this kind of behavior. It can range from mischievous to threatening, and on that night... Ned and I were on the receiving end of some particularly threatening rock-throwing toward our camp. We had both heard of such things, but to have it happen to us was terrifying, and I'm not sure I had been emotionally prepared for something this strange to happen. We huddled together like two frightened children, both of us in one small tent. By the time we noticed the sun coming up, the pelting seemed to stop. We immediately got out of that tent and broke down camp. As we did so, we saw them circling the camp, still there after dawn, popping into sight for a second, then remerging with the shadow. They were not Sasquatch, as we had expected. Either that, or they were some kind of dog-headed breed of Sasquatch, They let us see them well enough in the morning light of that day that we knew we were overmatched. And we knew we needed to leave that area at once and with great haste. Ned and I hiked for three days to get out of there and all day long on each of those days we could see signs that we were being followed. You could see the brush moving sometimes. You could hear their steps echoing yours, others. At night, we would hear them howling and barking at each other in the woods surrounding us. One howl on the left, answered by another on the right. We wondered if they were pushing us into a trap or if they were just seeing to it that we left. In all of this time, we never once ran into another human being. Well, the ending is anticlimactic. We got to our car in the midday sun, and, both of us exhausted from lack of sleep and days of extreme stress, we drove off home to get ourselves some rest. I have done my research, and I haven't found any stories similar to ours that took place in this area. I would go back to that park, as this story happened so long ago. I think it was just one of those once-in-a-lifetime events, and I doubt we'd ever again run into the New Hampshire Dogman. Before we begin, allow me to mention that today's show is executive produced by Michelle Rich. Thank you, Michelle. We couldn't do it without you. If you'd like to be a Scary Stories NYC executive producer like Michelle, 
Just join our paid subscribers club at peterbernard.com. And now let's begin the show with a story sent in by a parent about his son. We call this tale, My Son is Obsessed with Dogman. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I'm writing to you and your audience because I'm wondering if my son is overly obsessed with the Dogman. It's possible I'm making a mountain out of a molehill, but this is gnawing at me, and I have a growing suspicion that it might be better to get ahead of this before it's too late. It started with him loving werewolf movies when he was younger and getting involved with underworld subculture, but when he started hanging with these metal kids, he kind of got darker, and the situation started to frighten my wife. One night, I was up late watching a movie downstairs and my wife was upstairs asleep. Our son, let's call him Clive, came home and was completely flying. I'm not sure what he was on, but he was on a lot of it. I'm not judgmental about that sort of thing, but he didn't look like he was having a very good time. He was shaking. He was crying. And he kept looking over his shoulder and out of the window. I asked him what was wrong, and he told me he was chased home by a lichen. I suppressed a laugh, and he wasn't so wasted that he didn't notice. Over and over, he assured me and tried to convince me that he had, in fact, seen something that looked like a lichen from Underworld. I had no doubt then and have none now that he saw what he said he saw, but I just figured... It was a very real hallucination. I finally got him in bed and sleeping by the time my wife was waking up, so I didn't get any sleep myself till that afternoon. Soon after that, not the next day, but maybe six days or a week later, I was getting up to relieve myself in the middle of the night, and I distinctly heard crying. I did my business first because I'm old. Then, I went to look to see where the crying was coming from. It was Clive's bedroom, which surprised me. He was never the crying type. I asked him what was wrong, and he asked me if I didn't hear it. I listened quietly for a while, then eventually, I did hear it. Some kind of scratching and banging noise of some kind, coming from downstairs. What is that? I asked him. He started crying quietly all over again. Then he told me. It was the dog man, the lichen. He told me it had his scent and it knew where he lived. And it was only a matter of time before he, Clive, was a goner. I studied my son's face and eyes and he looked sober to me. Sad, but sober. This confused me a great deal. He was straight now, and he was still talking about this werewolf creature, as though it were for real. I decided to get up and go downstairs and look at this thing for myself. As I walked down the staircase, I could hear the sounds. It was being made by something alive. It was somewhat random. I could make it out better with each step I took downward, and it made my chest feel very tight. It was becoming less abstract and more concrete with every forward movement I made, and I was wondering if I really wanted to know what the source of that sound was. Suddenly, my son's crying became more real to me as well. I bent and craned my neck toward the kitchen, and I could see the bottom of the kitchen door shaking each time the sound happened. It was someone trying to get in our kitchen door. I ran upstairs and called the police, then woke my wife and comforted our son. The cops didn't find much except that our door's handle was damaged and would need to be replaced. They suggested we put in a security camera. We got an entire new and sturdier door as well as cameras for both the front and rear entrances later that day. So, a few nights later I ran into Clive and he seemed light-hearted and happy. I asked him if he had gotten over his dogman problem and he laughed and told me it was completely taken care of. 
I asked him what that meant, and his friends showed up, so our conversation got interrupted. How could he go from thinking his life was at risk to being so certain that he was safe in just a few days? I wonder if he and his friends didn't do something, either on purpose or by accident, which attracted the dogman to Clive. Then maybe they dispelled the creature in the same or a similar manner. Could my son be involved in some kind of dark arts? Is he summoning and banishing monsters? If the dogman was an animal or even a person who transformed into a lichen or werewolf, then the only way to be safe again would be to end the life of the creature. So either my son must have done that, or else he must have used magic to send the monster back from whence it came. The only other option is that he hallucinated the entire thing, and I don't see how that could be the case, since I myself saw that kitchen door shaking. I had to pay for the new door, too. I can tell you that part was not a hallucination. On the other hand, I was too scared for my life and too eager to call the police to have taken the time to actually look out a window and see if that was in fact what my son said it was. Maybe it was just one of his friends trying to get in. Maybe it was a crazy burglar or a random lunatic. All I know is, Clive's gone back to being secretive around me. It could mean any number of things. None of them really very good things either. Those boys all wear werewolf t-shirts. They seem to identify with the creatures even after Clive had his terrifying experience that left him in tears for days. Something about it doesn't make sense to me, and something about it feels wrong. If you have any advice for me, please let me hear it, as I feel I'm running out of ideas. I don't know how big a problem it might actually be because... My son is obsessed with the dogman. Well, sir, I would like to say that I am not a human, so I cannot give you advice for your human family of three. I once ate a human family of three, and while it was not my favorite thing to eat, I have to admit I would do it again, depending how hungry I was and what else was in season. I have heard that humans have head shrinkers they go visit when their brains hurt, so perhaps you can go to see one of those experts and maybe they can get you into family therapy or something. Perhaps our audience may have better advice in the comments. Some of our audience is human, just like you, so I'm sure they would understand this issue far better than I ever could. Good luck. And now, get your popcorn ready and get comfortable. Because here comes our second Dogman story of the day. This one continues our theme, and we call it... Dogman Breakfast Dear Scary Stories NYC, I have a story about seeing Dogman for you. It's brief but it's true. I was sitting in my kitchen, eating breakfast, and looking out my kitchen window which looks out to the backyard. It was a dark morning, overcast as though it were raining, but it was still dry out. In fact, the first rumble of thunder off in the distance is what drew my eyes to look out the window in the first place. I didn't see lightning, but what I did see was far more shocking. I saw, for lack of a better term, a dogman. It was standing by a tree toward the back of my yard, and it was doing something that involved it bending over and then standing up straight. It looked like a dog touching its toes like in those old Jack LaLanne videos. Actually, your audience might not be old enough to remember Jack LaLanne, so feel free to insert another exercise guru in there. Maybe there was something at the dog man's feet that it was messing with, possibly. It was mostly hidden from about the knees on down by the trunk of a tree, but that tree bends and branches out further upward from there, so I could see a lot of the dog man most of the time. To be clear, it was dark out. The creature was standing under some heavy tree cover, and it was extremely hard to see. 
But once you saw it, then you couldn't help but see it, if that makes any sense. What first caught my interest was the eye shine. I've heard people describe Dogman as having unnaturally bright eye shine, so bright that they thought it was electric lights. This was not like that at all. It didn't look like the creature was lit from within, but it was very bright eye shine. I would say as bright as a cat's eye shine. This creature was built for nocturnal hunting, in my opinion, as it would explain why it needs eyes capable of dilating to that extent. Maybe that's an overly obvious observation, but it's just something that occurred to me, which I don't hear discussed every day. The dog itself was dark, or its fur was, but I can't say exactly what color. I'm not really even sure if it was lighter or darker than its background, because I wasn't taking mental notes at the time. I was thinking to myself that I should get a picture of this or some video. I looked around and felt in my pocket, but then realized I had left my cell phone at my bedside. I ran to get it, but by the time I got back, I didn't see the dog man out there anymore. I'm pretty sure it was gone, but I wasn't certain enough to risk going out there and looking around. It started pouring out with lightning and thunder and I sat in my kitchen and watched. It was scary. I felt like any second the dogman was going to pop its head up from under the windowsill and that would be the end of me. But I didn't see the dogman again and after it stopped raining I decided to get online and see what new security camera equipment would cost. I ended up setting up a video camera in that kitchen window which records to its own computer and I have trail cams situated at two points in the backyard and three spots in that patch of trees back there. We live three blocks from a nature preserve that I won't name, so obviously that's got my vote as to where he must call home. It's possible that, even though he might live three blocks away, he might never happen to walk through my yard ever again. So, it's been nearly nine months since the breakfast sighting, and I've gotten lots of nice photos of nature, including a video of a cardinal, but I have never captured any photo or footage of the dogman at all. Neither have I or any of my neighbors seen one of the creatures since then either. One of my neighbors did introduce me to a hunter who claims to be an expert on the habits of the dogman that lives in our part of the world. I asked him if I grew berry bushes, might it attract him back? He told me that Bigfoot are known to eat blueberries, but uh, Dogman is a carnivore and or a scavenger. In other words, it only eats meat. Why don't you tie your children or your pets up out back, he suggested. That ought to attract the Dogman. He thought he was being really funny. So, I haven't yet figured out a safe way to get the Dogman to come back to our yard and get his picture taken. I'll leave up the cameras for as long as I can manage it and afford it. And you never know, maybe someday I'll get a second course of The Breakfast Dogman Dogman On my girlfriend's property Dear Scary Stories NYC I have a story about seeing the dogman that actually happened Well, it happened to my girlfriend Or maybe I should say ex-girlfriend She broke up with me because she felt I got too interested in the dogman on my girlfriend's property. One time, I was texting with my girl on a school night, and she mentioned that she was watching a dog-headed man walking around outside her window. I literally was throwing my shoes on as I sent her a text back, saying I was on my way. Even if she was joking, I was up for the walk. She lives two blocks away, right on the edge of the woods. By the time I got there, she greeted me at the front door, telling me to go home. She said it was too late, and she hadn't invited me. I didn't get her message fast enough, and soon her dad was leaning out the window, telling me to stop harassing his family. It took a few days to smooth over all that conflict, which I should have taken as a sign or an omen. This was going to be a bad thing to pursue. The next night... 
that I was over her family's house. I was distracted all through dinner. Two different times, I realized I wasn't listening when people asked me questions. I was too busy looking outside, all around, wondering if the dog man was somewhere out there. I hoped and literally prayed to get to see the dog man before I went over there that night. I mean, it was like some people get excited to meet a celebrity or a famous person. That's how excited I was about the idea that I might see the dog man. My girlfriend explained that I was being rude because I wanted to see the dog-headed man for myself. Oh, that thing? Was the general response. Soon, my girlfriend's mother, father, and younger brother had all explained to me in some detail that the dog man, quote, always, unquote, walked around their property at night. They thought I was a bit of a bore for caring so much about something so insignificant. I insisted that what they thought was unimportant might be the most important scientific find of our lifetime. And my girlfriend's father stood up, leaned over in my face, glared directly into my eyes and asked me, Are you telling me I'm wrong in my own house? I said no, sir, and backed away, sinking deeper into my dinner chair. He leaned over more and got in my face once again, then asked another question, the spit flying in my face as he did so. Are you telling me I'm wrong about an animal that walks around my own property? The property I own? Are you really doing that? I assured him in a quiet voice that I was not in any way questioning his correctness and that I agreed with everything he had said. I assured him it was confusion caused by my improper use of semantics and I grabbed my napkin to wipe his mouth slime off my face. Whenever I got to go up with my girlfriend to her bedroom after that, I was always asking her questions about the dog man. Which window had she seen him from? What was he doing? Where was he standing? And even when she could manage to change the subject to anything else, I found my mind wandering with my eyes back out her windows and down to the yard below. The last time I was up there, I thought I saw the dog man in the yard and I stood up quickly shouting there it is as I did this I accidentally tripped over an electric cord to her very breakable glass light which of course fell on the floor and shattered loudly my girlfriend had been doing her nails and my sudden loud noises and movements caused her to accidentally get nail polish all over her bed and her new outfit to top it all off when I got to the window I could see that it was only the neighbor's dog playing around in the dark, possibly chasing some small prey. I apologized profusely and offered to pay her back for the damage, but when she told me what her clothes and bed linens cost, I realized that was going to take me some long time to pay back. That seems to have been when my girlfriend had enough of me and my interest in the dog man. She told me if the only thing I cared about was dog man... I should go stare out the windows of my own home. After all, I only live two blocks away. The thing is, my house is in the middle of the block. There aren't as many trees on my block, and it's a whole lot better lit. It may as well be a mile from the woods as two blocks. So, now, I'm officially dumped by my girlfriend, and her dad has officially banned me from his property. I climbed out of my bedroom window to my family house's roof, to see if I could see the woods from there and maybe set up a monitoring station. But my mom caught me out up there and I got grounded for the next month. Life just seems to keep getting worse and worse. And the worst part is, I still haven't gotten even one glimpse of the dog man on my girlfriend's property. Before we begin, please allow me to thank Sexy Clown 100 who is today's executive producer. Thanks, Sexy Clown 100. We couldn't do it without you. If you'd like to become a Scary Stories executive producer of the day like Sexy Clown 100,
just join our very affordable sliding scale paid subscribers club over at peterbernard.com. And now, let's get started with our story in which we begin to understand the mythic, almost gorgon-like effect that seeing an upright walking canid can have on certain human nervous systems. Sometimes, even the bravest of people can freeze up like a block of ice when they are forced into a confrontation with a dog-headed hairy monster. That's what happened to the anonymous writer who sent us this allegedly true narrative we've rewritten into a tale called Petrified by Dogman. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I was once with a group of friends goofing off in the woods near our town when we all saw a dogman, just like the ones people describe on your channel. All of my friends ran, but I became frozen just as though I were having some sort of sleep paralysis experience, even though I was fully awake. I became unable to escape the danger because I was petrified by the dogman. I looked up that word petrified. It turns out it comes from the same source as the name Peter, so you might already know its meaning. Petros is a Greek word for stone or rock, and to become petrified means to seem as though you've hardened into stone and are unable to move. This is what happened to me, and I have no explanation for it. Before you jump to conclusions that I am a coward or weak, or unable to cope under emergency conditions. You should know that I am an army combat veteran. I've saved my buddies' lives, handled myself well enough while under enemy fire. To me, though, the sight of that dogman was far worse than anything I'd ever seen before. I'm having to wipe the tears out of my eyes repeatedly even as I type this. The idea of that thing is so horrible to me even still. I don't understand how my friends had the ability to run that day. My knees were locked into place, and the only thing I could do was stare at that thing. That horrible, unnatural, impossible thing with the rancid-looking dog head. I mean, this thing just didn't look like an upright walking dog. It was not a magnificent beast of the forest or anything like that. It wasn't like seeing a bear where you're afraid for your life, but you're also just in awe at the creatures that nature can create. This dogman, or whatever you want to call it, looked like a walking disease. It didn't look natural, and maybe that's why it froze me to my spot. Nothing in wartime had ever been too much for me to handle. That's the world of man, and I'm confident that I know the rules of the world of man. The dogman comes from the world of the unnatural and paranormal, at least in my opinion. I have no control, and I have no understanding of that world. I have a deep and uncontrollable terror of that world, and I coped with that bottomless chasm of fear for years by telling myself that it just doesn't exist. It worked fine to protect me, until the moment that my buddies screamed and ran away from something that couldn't possibly exist. We went from laughing and having fun to them leaving and me reacting as though I had stared into the face of Medusa the Gorgon. It was almost as though everything became more like a play or a TV show at that point, although I'm not trying to say that I left my body and watched from above or anything like that. I was still within myself, somewhere I suppose, but it was almost as though my thinking mind and even my active living consciousness retreated or turned off and we just watched this thing, which proved that our entire worldview was wrong. This sick looking, beat up, mangy cur of a monster towering over me and looking down on me, it was evidence that we are never safe. We can never be safe. The concept of safety is a bad, unfunny joke, because things like this dog-headed, 
upright walking illness exist. It leaned its head down into my view and began sniffing my eyes and mouth. Its nose alone was as large as my head. I could see the lice moving through the fur on its snout. It could have eaten the top third of me with one bite. I was so nervous that I wasn't even shaking in fear. I wasn't moving at all. And then, the dog man withdrew in disgust from me. Something about me made him as sick as he made me. I guess we were just oil and water. Maybe he didn't want to believe in me any more than I wanted to believe in him. After I heard him leave, my knees buckled and I found myself down on all fours, being very sick all over the forest floor. When I was able to walk again, I was unable to stop openly weeping. All of the men I had seen lose their lives in front of me that I never cried for. My buddies, who lost parts of themselves, fighting to keep you and me free, I never cried for them before either. After surviving that dogman experience, I felt so deeply for everyone I had ever known. I felt such deep empathy that it's changed my life ever since then. I don't understand how I survived what happened to me. I don't understand why the creature let me go. That should have been my last day on earth. Now that I've been granted this extra time that I do not deserve and I did not earn, I want to express my gratitude toward everyone I get to share my life with. I look them in the eye to let them know I recognize the human soul inside them. I recognize the real self inside there, and I'm grateful to get to be in your presence when I am. I know everything could end tomorrow, or even a second from now. I know that there is no such thing as safety, and I know that horror and evil are very real and tangible things something I had always managed to deny before. But their existence only serves to demonstrate how much more we should appreciate and enjoy each other and everything in our lives that's good and decent. And none of these deep life changes and philosophical paradigm shifting could have happened if I hadn't been petrified by the dogman, scared out of her mind, by the dog man. Dear Scary Stories NYC, my mother told me a story about the dog man. It didn't happen to her, it happened to her Aunt Ida, who passed on when I was very young. According to mom's story, Aunt Ida was scared out of her mind by the dog man. After my great uncle Herbert left this mortal realm, Aunt Ida decided to use some of the money he'd left her and get her own little house out in the woods. My mom was very against this idea as Aunt Ida was renting the house, not buying it, and my mother considers that throwing cash down the drain. She said the rent was very high and only meant for vacationers and tourists, not for long-term stays like what Aunt Ida was doing. Nevertheless, when Aunt Ida made up her mind... She stuck to her decision as though her life depended on it. One night, Aunt Ida was awakened by a horrible noise coming from the garden. She looked out her bedroom window, and her eyes were accosted by the terrible sight of an immense monster doing something terrible to a raccoon, something that I won't even tell you. Aunt Ida, of course, screamed in horror, and the immense thing turned to glare in her direction. According to my great aunt, what she saw sizing her up was shaped roughly like a man, but the largest and bulkiest man she'd ever laid eyes on. It was all muscle and fur is what my mother told me, she said. All muscle and fur. Not an ounce of fat on the hairy beast, and it had an unholy-looking devil head resembling a dog's head 
more than it resembled any other natural animal, because although she could see that it ate flesh like a natural animal, this glowing-eyed monstrosity before her could not in any way be anything created by God or by the forces of good. She claimed it kind of roared at her. It was not a barking sound as one might expect from a canine, but closer to a roar that one might hear from a lion or maybe an alligator. It opened its mouth wide while creating an intensely loud and long bellow and she could see not only how long and intensely sharp its teeth looked, but also how large its mouth and throat was. This thing could probably swallow a small human in one gulp like a jungle snake might. It could open its jaws to a ridiculously wide degree, like we've seen in that old film of a thylacine. Maybe this wasn't a mammal, but actually a marsupial, like the thylacine once was. Maybe this wasn't actually a canine, but a parallel species mimicking canines in appearance and some behavior. Its eyes were certainly not canine in the opinion of Aunt Ida, but she didn't think that meant it was a marsupial. She thought that meant it was demonic and supernatural, and it was that notion which began to slowly lead the poor lady insane. Once you think something lurking outside of your house at night has supernatural powers. You've opened a can of worms for your imagination to play with that you might never be able to close up ever again. Once the creature has one supernatural power, why not assume it has lots of supernatural powers? Why not begin to imagine that it's reading your mind? That's what Anida did. Why not imagine that it's spying on you? Even that it's influencing your decisions without you knowing it. That's what Aunt Ida did, too. Pretty soon, she was questioning her own decisions and those of everyone around her, wondering which were genuine thoughts and ideas, and which were bad ideas put into human heads by the dogman who she imagined having greater and vaster powers every single day. Mom said that by the time she got Aunt Ida to voluntarily admit herself to the sanitarium, the poor old lady agreed to it to protect herself from the dogman that she assumed was after her and lurking somewhere on her property. Once in the hospital, though, Aunt Ida announced that the dogman was able to still control her thoughts and actions and that distance did not matter to his psychic control. Mom said Aunt Ida just went crazier and crazier until she died of insanity. Now I looked it up, and you can't die of insanity. If Mom got that part wrong, I wonder how many other aspects of the story were told to me in a somewhat inaccurate way. After all, when Aunt Ida was committed, Mom is the one who got control of her estate. I don't want to accuse my own mother of anything, but she would have had motivation for wanting Aunt Ida in a sanitarium and out of control of the purse strings to that fortune that Uncle Herbert left. Still, what I've told you is the official family account of how Aunt Ida was scared out of her mind by the dog man. Scared straight by the dog man. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I have a story to tell you about the dog man that wasn't just a sighting from a distance. I had one of the most horrifying personal encounters possible, and it completely changed me as a person. I'm not saying it made me a better man, but I'm saying it made me too timid to ever break the law again. I went from being afraid of nothing and willing to do anything a man of no personal morality who obeyed no law, to a mouse, afraid of everything, and too frightened to disobey any law or any rule because I just don't feel up to defending myself against the punishment. I thought I was undefeatable, but then I was defeated by the dog man. A buddy of mine from high school had a hard time getting work during a period that I was working in construction. 
One time I ran into him and he told me that he was staking out and robbing houses in the rich town over a few miles away from us. I made a mental note of that, and when all the construction work dried up for a while, I gave that old friend a call. Pretty soon, we were a team, him and me. He taught me everything he knew, and we could both cover each other no matter what happened. I learned which alarm systems you could bypass or disconnect, and which ones it was better to avoid. I learned about security camera systems, angry house pets, and where people thought it would be clever to hide their valuables. In short, I quickly became an expert of my new craft. We both got cocky, which was dumb, since we weren't just involved in stealing people's valuables, we were involved in selling those stolen items afterward. There were so many ways we could mess up and get caught. My friend and I came to a parting of the ways when we got a cache of very ancient items made largely of gold. These items basically told an important untold story of a part of human prehistory that very little is officially known about. My partner wanted to melt them down and sell the gold. I wanted to try to sell them to private collectors for the most part but I also wanted to anonymously donate two of the most important pieces to a legitimate museum. I thought we owed it to the world not to destroy these items. My partner thought it was greed and pride on my part. He said I wanted the extra money we might make selling them intact because I was greedy. But then he contradicted himself and said I wanted to give the items away to feel that I was some kind of benefactor to humanity instead of a common house thief which is what I really was. That stung, partially because it was hurtful, and also partially because it landed right on the bullseye of the target. He was correct in his criticism of me, but that still didn't, in my mind, justify melting down priceless items of ancient golden artworks. He and I fought, and eventually decided on a way to split up and go our separate ways. We picked a boundary line, and agreed not to work on each other's turf, then parted company. I should have either gotten out of the business then, or else gotten myself a new partner. But instead, for whatever reason, I just rented a car, went to my new location, and cased the neighborhood out for a while, getting to know the rhythm of the place. It was a more heavily forested town, very sleepy and friendly. I was thinking when I managed to steal and fence enough to eventually afford it, I might even consider moving to that place. That's how nice it seemed. And so, it came to be that I was in the bushes, in the dark, outside my next intended housebreaking, waiting for the young, rich, married couple who lived there to get in their car and drive off for their weekly Friday night dinner in town, followed by dancing. They would be gone until at least at midnight if they stayed true to form, and I would have plenty of time to grab her jewelry and get his bedroom safe open. It was a model of safe that I had never taken more than 45 minutes to crack, not the latest model. That might indicate that the contents were similarly not extremely valuable, or it might just mean that this guy didn't know much about safes. They had a lot of electronic gadgets around in there that I thought I might pocket a few of as well. Not to sell, but to keep and use. Like I said, I had gotten cocky. I thought I was bigger than the Beatles. So, on that night, I was guesstimating in my head while squatting in the wet bushes, wondering how much money I could raise from whatever haul I managed to obtain from inside that house. When suddenly bottoms of my feet began to tickle and itch. I didn't understand what that meant at first, so I sat down on my butt on the dirt, trying to scratch my feet. Doing that only made my butt tickle and itch instead. It was at that point that I comprehended that the ground itself was vibrating. I sat still, trying to understand what was happening, and I could then begin to hear it, a growling, a very, very deep growling. Then 
I could hear the breathing and the salivating and the snarling, and I understood I was in the presence of some kind of very large and dangerous animal. I could smell the terrible breath of the creature, and I felt the warmth off of its body as I turned around to witness what I call horror itself. My friends make fun of me for that. They say I'm trying to act like I'm a poet instead of a beat-up old former house thief, but it's not true. That's just what I saw. It might as well have been the devil itself. They have that old saying about how, oh, I was so scared my blood ran cold. That always sounded so corny to me, so stupid and old-fashioned. But when I turned and saw that monster leaning over me and breathing down my neck in a literal fashion, my entire body went cold as though my blood had turned to ice. And I began shivering and having a hard time controlling my movements. It was as though I had been plunged unexpectedly into a vat of the coldest ice water. I crawled a short distance away, and the thing reached one very long fur-covered arm out to me and snagged my pants leg on just one of his long, curved, dagger-like claws. He was toying with me. I was like a cat toy for the dog man. I screamed and tried to get away, I was looking right into nightmare itself. I was staring into the face of literal insanity. I was never so scared in my life. This was not just an animal. This was kind of the embodiment of fear to me. I can't describe how scared I was. It was an unnaturally fierce and extreme kind of fright. I had never experienced anything like that before, and I hope I never have anything like that happen again. I remember my chest clenching up and I remember seeing black spots around the edges of my vision. I must have passed out as I woke up when the police officer kicked me to see if I was dead. I got taken in and they soon searched my home. That linked me to a number of other home break-ins and it linked my former partner to one of the crimes as well. We both confessed everything and got lighter sentences in exchange for testimony that helped bring down a bigger fish than either of us. But I'll still be on the inside for another five years before parole even becomes something we start chatting about. That's fine with me. I could stay in jail for the rest of my life. They've got rules here and I don't have to think anymore. I just follow the rules and I get rewarded. I get up when they say, eat what they say, work and sleep when they think I should. It's like a vacation for me now. I no longer think I'm unbeatable because I got beat by the dog man. I no longer think I'm so big and bad. I'm grateful for the prison food and grateful for my prison bed. I'm actually afraid to go back out to your world with all your free choice. I pity you with all the choices you're forced to make, all the chances you have to take. I'd be too terrified to deal with all that anymore. I've got post-dogmatic stress disorder. I was scared straight by the dog man. Up next, we've got a submission from our narrator, Ralph. He's sent us a whole bunch of stories, some of which happened to him, and others of which are alleged to have happened to his ancestors. He claims that his family lives with habituated dogmen on their property. If you're a long-time viewer of this channel, then you may have heard some of his stories before. This was actually the very first one he ever sent in, and it's called... My Mother and the dog man. Dear viewers, I would like to share with you the epic and ongoing tale of my family and our literally thousands of experiences with dog man. I will be your narrator. You can call me Ralph. 
I will lie to you right now and tell you that this ongoing saga is called Dogman Daily because my name is Ralph Daly and I am a dogman. But in reality, Daly is a fake last name. Ralph is a fake first name. I am not a dogman and it's called Dogman Daly because whenever anyone from our family runs inside screaming that they just got chased by a dogman or stalked by one or they saw a dogman do something horrible yet again, the rest of us shout out, the Dogman Daily has just been delivered. Afternoon edition or whatever. It's an old joke now. I don't know if people actually get afternoon newspapers delivered to them any longer. I know we don't. We did when I was a kid. We had all the newspapers delivered back then. It was a very, very, very different time, even for my family. And we are not a family known to change anything until it absolutely can't be resisted any longer. We still had rotary phones here in the mid-1990s. I remember wanting to phone my friend to tell them what happened to Kurt Cobain, but I had to dial the old rotary dial and it took me two tries to get it right. It's a strange memory to have attached to a sad event, but it led me to personally updating our telecommunications, our heating, air conditioning, whole lot of things in the house before the year 2000. We are not what would be thought of as old money in Europe. But, we are very old money for where we live in North America. We are influential enough locally that I don't want to divulge where locally is. I do have to admit that it is a forested area in order to tell you our saga, and even that makes me nervous to reveal. You see, Dogman is not the only thing my family tries to keep secret on this property. I could write a book about any number of the secrets we hide because we've had some secretive ancestors and we've had them for generations. We've also had some real collectors. One of them, Uncle Grover, toured the world as a trophy hunter. We had all sorts of stuffed animals and animal heads all over the house making it like the Adams Family house to me when I was young. A few of them remain... The rest were either auctioned or put into storage. I brought the bear out of storage a year after we put it in and restored it to its old location near the fireplace in the library. My younger brother and sister are offended by it, so I told them to just use the dozens of other rooms in the house and allow me and the bear our privacy in the library. I don't think they're happy with that stalemate. I suspect they want to cancel old Mr. Bear. He was stuffed in the upright bipedal position that bears sometimes adopt. And to be honest, I feel safer when he's around, as silly as I know it is for an adult to admit that. But, even though I love my family's home, and I would never want to leave, it genuinely can be unnerving to live surrounded by these werewolf-like beasts. Even though we leave them raw meat out in the woods to keep them away from the house, there are some of them that don't seem content to scavenge. Some of them are only interested in consuming that which they have hunted down themselves. So I hear some of you asking, if you're supposedly a well-off family, why wouldn't you either move or take action to remove the dogman from your land. And I hear some of the rest of you asking, why don't we have scientists and Bob Bigelow here studying the phenomenon, if I'm not just making all this up? Well, in the early days, my family basically fought a war against these things. I have a lot of stories from that time, and I hope to get to tell you a number of them on this new series that starts Monday, October 28th, right here on the Scary Stories NYC channel. When my family first settled here, we were farmers. We cut down enough of the forest to build us a house and a barn, then set about farming on the land that we had cleared. By the early 20th century, Uncle Grover was the first of us to have graduated from college, and he took more of the forest down, maximized the family's return on the land, and move them up a level into what eventually became an entirely different kind of business. The less said about that here, the better. So, 
The next generation of the family were not salt of the earth types. They were leaders in the world of business and amassed what at the time seemed like a vast fortune. During this era, the forest reclaimed most of the farm. The house was remodeled and had two wings added. From that point on, the place was officially a creepy mansion, as there were secret tunnels leading from various rooms to various others, since I don't know who or what used to be in most of those old rooms. I don't know the original function of any of these passageways. Well, I do know there was one hidden door in a maid's quarters, so possibly that one was there as a discreet way for one of the family to have secret visits with the hired help. There were also tunnels and storage rooms built under the house that were supposedly originally dirt floor rooms from what I've heard, but have been paved with concrete and stone since probably the 1920s. Parts were turned into a wine cellar at some point after that. My father remembers the dates for that kind of stuff better than I do. I only remember the details about the Dogman stories. And now, I'd like to tell you one. This Dogman story was told to me by my mother. It was really the first time I can remember anyone telling me about the Dogman. Maybe they had, and I just didn't remember, but... This was the time I really took notice that this was a thing I would need to take seriously. This was the story that first made me afraid of the dogman. My parents' marriage was an arranged marriage. It was 1963, not 1463, so that might sound strange. But in that year, my grandfather wanted a merger with a certain other successful family business. Both patriarchs liked the idea, and so my dad was set to marry the daughter of Grandpa's rival that he wanted to turn into an ally. My father was old enough and wise enough to understand the ramifications of the agreement. If he could form a real marriage with that woman, both families stood to move up into a world that they had both only glimpsed longingly from a distance. It would change everything, not only for them, but for their children, and their children's children. And so, my father decided he would be in love with my mom, and then he was, and then they met. And mom was terrified of dad the way I'm scared of Dogman. Dad allowed mom's sister Mildred to move into the mansion and take the room next to mom's. This way, she could report back to their side of the family if mom was unhappy, and the marriage could be annulled, the plan abandoned. So, Aunt Mildred moved in, and soon, she and Dad became really good friends. This surprised everyone. Dad encouraged Mildred to consider his home her home for life if she so chose. They began palling around so much that mom got jealous and moved Mildred to a wing of the house further away so that she could have dad to herself. Soon, mom was expecting me. This story happened during that time. Mildred had gotten into the habit of collecting wildflowers growing around the land and making bouquets of them for the dinner and breakfast tables. It was growing near the end of the season for most of the flowers when she went out to look for one more bouquet in the afternoon one day. My mom told me she joined her sister, wondering where it was she went when she would go out by herself. They wandered into various areas and mostly along the edge of the woods, which had been encroaching for decades over what used to be the farm. They weren't finding much of what they were looking for. It was getting kind of late for flowers, and Mildred had already picked so many of them. She took a turn into the woods, and my mother did not want to follow her. She thought it looked too dark in those woods for any flowers to be growing in there anyway. Mildred said something about mountain flowers down the way, and Mom rolled her eyes and trailed after her. Mountain flowers in the forest, whatever. According to Mom, it got darker and darker the deeper they went into the woods. There weren't many flowering plants in there. Bushes, 
thorny ones sometimes, an area with some berry plants, lots of oak trees, and then mom told me she saw the rotting remains of the old barn. She understood better then why my father and grandfather would sometimes still refer to the lawn and forest as the farm. She hadn't really thought it through before, it just seemed an eccentricity on his side of the family. This actually was a farm, or at least it was at one time in the past. Mildred had already known about the barn, so she took Mom over to it to point out something or other that she had noticed. Mom said it looked so unsteady that a strong wind might topple it over on top of her, so she didn't really want to get too close. According to Mom, they both noticed a dog head peering out at them from a window in the old wooden structure. Mildred let out her doggy whistle that she had always done since they were kids together with their old dog, Constance. This dog's ears went straight up, even as it took a step back into the darkness of the interior of the barn. As it pulled back out of the light, you could still see exactly where it was, because in the dark, those eyes glowed this bright yellowish-white color. It was like cat's eyes, but not cat's eyes. It wasn't a normal kind of dog she could already tell. Mildred whistled again, and my mom tried to get her to stop. She was already afraid of the dog in there. It burst through the barn doors, all teeth and fangs and growling this growl that mom said sounded like the letter N, just like he was teaching the letter N to everyone he met that day. He said that letter in the most frantic and stressed out way it had ever been said. The thing was a dog, but it was not on all fours. It stood up like a bear and seemed to want the two of them to be as frightened of it as it could possibly make them. Standing up like that, it was taller than a man, and both of the young women ran. My mother said she instantly lost sight of Aunt Mildred and ran as fast as she could in random directions through the trees until she didn't hear the monster behind her anymore. She spotted a large cavity in the roots of one tree that she fit herself into and made herself as small as possible. She pulled part of a nearby bush over her and hoped her scent would be hidden by the bush as well. Then she sat and waited and tried to be as quiet and still as she could. Soon she heard someone walking slowly toward her it might be Mildred. It might be the dog man. It might be someone else. She just had to listen and pray. Eventually, out of her peripheral vision, she saw the figure approaching. It was too large to be her sister. It took another step forward, and she risked moving her eyes to her right to see it better. It was the two hind legs of a very tall wolf or wolf-like creature. She wanted to scream. It took all of her effort to keep from screaming. Tears poured out of my mother's eyes, giving her blurry vision, but she couldn't wipe the tears away. Moving her arm would give away her position to the slowly approaching dogman. The tears burned, and she had great difficulty breathing silently. She just wanted to be back inside where it was safe. She just wanted to be out of that forest. And then there came a sound like a branch cracking off in the distance. The dogman's attention was drawn away from where I was to its right. It stared silently and unmoving off in the distance toward the direction 
where they had both heard that sound come from. The dogman's attention was drawn away from where my mother was to its right. It stared, silent and unmoving, off in the distance in the direction where they had both heard the sound come from. Mom prayed, Please, please go investigate that sound. Go over there. Please go over there. The dogman is apparently not as psychic as some of the stories about him would have us believe because he decided to ignore the other sound and turned his attention toward the bush that my mother was hiding behind. It took another step toward her and mom told me her life flashed in front of her eyes. She apologized in her mind to her mother and father for letting them down and ruining their business merger with my dad's family. She felt her time was up and she began tearfully accepting her fate. And then, she and the dogman both heard a whistle. It was Mildred's whistle. The dogman was once again interested in that same direction where the previous sound had come from. It must have been Mildred both times. The dogman charged off in the direction of the whistling, and Mom leaped out from her hiding spot and ran home, weeping hysterically. According to my mother, she ran into the arms of one of the servants that was gone before my time, and she told her everything that had happened. Apparently, the wait staff were not at all surprised by any of this, and already had a standard procedure they followed when something like this would happen. After she had calmed down a bit, my mother asked everybody about her sister's location, she was told everyone thought Mildred was with my mother. Nobody had seen her come back since they had gone out together to look for flowers. Alarmed, the servants alerted my grandfather and father, then launched a search team into the woods to try to find Mildred before it was too late. Since the sequel to this story is a bit too graphic for this channel, we're going to run it privately for our paid subscribers on our secret channel. You can join our secret paid subscribers club at peterbernard.com for as little as $1.50 a month, although we hope you consider donating a bit more and helping the channel out. Whatever level you can afford though, you not only get part 2 of this story, but you also get our first 29 uncensored, secret, scary stories compiled into one 4 hour and 50 minute blockbuster video. It comes completely cross-referenced, so you can jump from story to story in just a click. Each title is listed next to a link to its starting time. Then, we add another all-new scary story, usually Dogman, every Sunday. That's all at peterbernard.com. We really appreciate your donations, especially right now. When Don't go anywhere. We've got one more all-new, never-before-heard Dogman story coming up right now. Return of the Dorseyville Dogman. Dear Scary Stories NYC. I'm the one who told you the story of my parents seeing a dogman in their backyard, which my father thought was the ghost of a shape-shifting brujo in his family's ancestry. Mom could see it too, though and said it was no ghost, but instead a real-life boogeyman. She scared me at night and got me to behave when I was young because I feared that the dog-headed hairy man would get me if I went out at night or if I misbehaved. When my mother passed on and I had to travel back to Dorseyville to go through the house and decide what to do with everything, I'm not sure I really entertained the notion of the dog man being real any longer. I had been vaguely aware of the current craze about the Michigan dog man, but I had not known that some people in Pennsylvania report seeing them as well. At any rate, when I went back to stay at the house for a week, I anticipated some bittersweet and melancholy nostalgia, but I most certainly did not expect a return visit from the Dorseyville dog man. I won't be one of those guys that beats around the bush with the story. It happened on my third night there, so I won't bother to tell you about the first two. 
I was in the kitchen, which has a window overlooking the back porch. I casually peered out that window, and I had the shock of my life. Out there, on the porch, facing away from me and toward the trees in the back, there was a man. A man in the middle of the night, standing on my family's porch, staring off at the trees. I dropped what I was doing and I ran outside. There was nobody there. I mean, when I saw that guy through the window, he was solid. He was real. When I didn't see him as I went outside, my first reaction was to jump down off the porch and look around fast to see if I could discover which way he ran or where he was hiding himself. I was 100% certain that I had seen a real man. It didn't take me long to realize that there was no place he could have gone to in that short amount of time where I wouldn't have been able to see him. I filled up with a kind of fear that I have not felt since I was a child. An absolute fear of the unknown that had gone away with adulthood. I didn't understand what had just happened, and that really scared me. Just then, I heard a branch snap in the trees, and I turned to see the image of many of my childhood nightmares. I saw, in actual physical form, the boogeyman of my youth. I watched as its glowing eyes, orange, not red, as Mom had said, glared at me as though they were trying to bore holes through me. I never felt so uninvited by an expression on a face before. I instantly ran back up on the porch and inside the house, double-locking the door behind me, then collapsing to the floor in shock. It was real. It had always been real. Unless... Unless both figures I saw, both the man and the animal man in the trees, unless both of them were ghosts? Because if my father was right, and that was the ghost of his skinwalker shape-shifting great-uncle, then the man on the porch staring out at him must have been the ghost of my own father. I spent that night in that house, jumping at every creak of the old building. The next morning, the bright sunshine did not bring any warmth with it. I had to get out of that house, so I just hired someone to trash everything left inside there. I took some family photos and a few other things to remember my childhood by, and left the rest in the past where it was more at home and that's also where i hope i left the dorseyville dog man do you have a scary story you want us to read on the show just call our voicemail hotline 804 le scary that's 804 537 2279 and now for something completely scary. Hey, it's me, Henry Lee Dogman, here to thank those of you who support all of us here at Scary Stories NYC. It really helps us if you click like, and if you forward our videos or leave cool comments. If you can, it helps us even more when you let us share our 25-episode and growing collection of uncensored, scary Dogman stories with you by becoming a paid subscriber at peterbernard.com. That's right, join our monthly club and get 25 stories right off the bat, each of them wilder than what we're allowed to tell you on this channel. Then, each Sunday, get another new scary story, usually a Dogman story, but always uncensored and secret, available nowhere else on the planet. Please consider joining us today at peterbernard.com and keep the scary stories coming. 
Thanks, everyone. If you enjoyed this, please click like or consider subscribing. Remember to click the bell icon or you won't get notifications. If you want to listen to Bigfoot's secret uncensored story each Sunday, just go to peterbernard.com and become a paid subscriber. See you tomorrow. Same dog time, same dog channel. Come back for more scary stories.